guess what? This is Law & Order SVU Season 3, Episode 13. Prodigy, we open up and it's nighttime on the docks and two cops are making their rounds talking cop to each other. Then suddenly there's some white dude in super tight jeans and he's looking awfully suspicious. Don't worry, he handles it very nonchalantly. Without saying anything, he slowly backs away. We got a runner. Before he takes off running, he tosses a duffel bag into the water. Catch up with him and tackle him to the ground. Well, one of the cops does. The other one trips on something. What did he trip on? Uh, no big deal. Just two dead bodies. Jump ahead and Benson and Stapler are on the scene. So there's one dead girl and one dead guy. And the way that they were posed after death was sexually. So did the girl have defensive marks? We don't fucking know. You want to know why? Her hands are missing. Benson picks up the sheet and goes, oh, so is her head. So the suspicious guy in the tight pants from the first scene, we're holding him, but we need an interpreter. This guy is deaf. We jump to an interrogation room and there's a cop of signs who is interpreting for the guy. His name is Scotty and he claims he doesn't need a fucking lawyer because he didn't do anything wrong. Okay, why were you on the docks that night? Okay, do you always run away from the cops and throw your bags? Was it because it was full of body parts? They start slapping down nasty crime scene photos. And both Scotty's face and the interpreter's face is like, ooh, tell us what was in the bag. But guess what? He doesn't need to tell them because they found it. <laughs> Downstream, like two seconds later. Was there a head and hands in it? No, just some computers and some jewelry from a houseboat. This guy's a burglar. He is not a murderer. We're gonna hand him off to burglary. Okay, Finn, where are we with the missing persons? Well, it's not so easy this time, boss. I'm missing some information. Height? Hair color, eye color. Let's go check the morgue. And who is this hot Emmy? Emmy Frat Rat says that guy was in his mid 50s and the woman was in her 40s. Aside from the obvious head and hand injury, both victims were jaggedly stabbed in the midsection. Oh, and that dude has a nasty laceration on his forehead. Oh, maybe from that rock? Uh-uh. The Emmy found tree bark embedded in it. Results from the rape kit came back with sperm sigh. Male victim's zipper was down. And there is some lipstick on his junk. Oh, he's wearing a wedding ring. Were they a married couple? Stabler's like, trust me, married couples do not have sex in parks. Okay, so what about, seriously, Kathy and I have the most boring sex you've ever seen. Yikes. Okay, anyway, sex with your wife is the worst thing ever. Jesus, Elliot. No hit on Prince on the male victim, but he did have a pacemaker. So we're gonna go to that company and figure out who this dude is. We find out the victim's name is Edward Boggs. Jump to Benson talking to Mrs. Boggs. The last time she saw her husband was before he left for work at 4 p.m. Okay, well, we're still putting together all the information, but he had a high level of alcohol in his system, lipstick on his Johnson, and died on top of a headless woman. She doesn't take that very well. Munch, Finn, and Cragen are watching from the other side of the two-way mirror. Cragen's like, okay, why don't you two go canvas the area? They start at the Broadway bar. And yeah, the bartender knows him. Whiskey, straight up. Been in every night for the last two weeks. The night he died, he was talking to one of the regulars. Vinny, scum. What were they talking about? Bitches, of course. Bitches this, bitches that. So next we bring in Vinny, and yeah, he's scum. Okay, Vinny, tell us about your night. Okay, we talked about bitches. Not his wife, his C-word boss. Apparently, she was a real ball buster. Edward wasn't at work because he got fired two weeks ago. That's why he was drinking so heavily. He was trying to get up the courage to go tell his wife the truth. When they left, Vinny was getting into a cab to go to another bar and... Ed was going into the woods because nature called. We gotta check some of this out. The team heads back to the crime scene. Sure enough, Finn finds a tree. A tree with blood on it. I bet if we run DNA analysis, we'll find some urine crotch height. <sighs> Holy shit. So Ed didn't have anything to do with this female victim? Stabler's like, okay, new theory. Perp rapes and kills the female Vic. And he's in the process of dismembering her when he hears something. It's Ed peeing on a tree. That's why his pants were open. But wait a second, what about that lipstick? Uh-uh, they think this guy is just fucking with them. He staged that relationship to throw them off and it fucking worked for a while. Benson gets a phone call and guess what they found? They found a hand in a sewer. So we head to the crime lab and there is a disgusting close up where the Emmy is pulling the fingertip off of this dead hand's thumb. But it gets worse. Olivia has to put it on her thumb to push it down for a print. Stabler's like, my hands are way too big. We jump ahead and it's nighttime at the precinct. Vinny's walking through on his way out. Hey, I passed the poly. Fuck off, 
get this idiot out of here. The thumbprint is back. We got a hit. Our female victim is special agent Pam Tilden. FBI? No. MFPCA. Really rolls off the tongue. Her division is to investigate animal cruelty. They see a picture of her. She's like in her 40s. She's got a cute little bob. She's got these little earrings that are like golden retrievers. They're golden, golden retrievers. So we head to the kennels and Joe Paletti, the dog walker there, shows us all the animals and is like, hey, you can adopt them if you want one. Benson kind of likes this dog, but she doesn't have time. She's married to her job. We get a whole stack of Pam's most recent case files. I don't know what is broken in my brain, but this is way worse than a lady without a head. Don't come in here with dog fighting rings and animal torture videos, no fucking things. But here's one we can't tune out. Some teenage kid set a cat on fire. The cat's fine, by the way, he's recovering, it's just the tail. While he was in a treatment program, he was threatening Agent Tilden. This kid's name is Harry Baker. He had a shit childhood. Mom couldn't afford daycare, so she brought him with her to work work at a strike club. It's fine. His counselor at school said, uh-uh, he's not in special ed. He's in the fucking gifted program. This kid is smart as hell. Kevin works for magic and gets a hold of Baker's file. There's not much in there because he's a juvenile, so it's sealed. But Benson starts reading what's there out loud. Probation officer recommended supervision based on agent Tilden's suspicion of numerous unadjudicated prior offenses. What the fuck does that mean? Cabot's gonna find out. So she tracks down the lawyer that worked on his case before. Hey, uh, we never had that lunch. That was a year ago. What the fuck do you want, Alex? He wants info. Spell. Okay, so he was tried for the cat one, but there was like a dozen other animal abuse cases that we couldn't pin on him. Except for one. Girl that he had the hots for, she turned him down. Then this girl's dog goes missing. Next day, her dog is back on her doorstep. Dead? decapitated. So Benson and Stabler head over to Harry Baker's place, obviously. He's not there, but mom is, and she is clearly a sex worker. Big Susan Sarandon energy. And this is gross. The only thing that separates her room with his is some beads in the doorway. So we go through the beads and take a look. He's got newspaper clippings of crime as his wallpaper and a whole bunch of books about serial killers. Oh, all in alphabetical order. Then you hear, are you looking for something? There's Harry with a straight up Devin Sawa haircut. Yeah, we wanna ask you some questions about Pam. He confirms that, yeah, he's known to hold a grudge, but he and Pam were cool. He read that her death was pretty whack, but he doesn't have all the details. You think you can give me some? No, can you give us any? He's down on his bed and is like, yeah, my therapist says I have a predisposition to aggression. I don't rechannel it. I could end up, oh, what do they call it? A cop. Okay, you little psychopath, I see you. What about that girl with the dog you killed? Carrie Thorne claims that he broke her heart. He drives all the girls crazy. Well, let's go ask Carrie Thorne. She's like, no, that dude's fucking psycho. Munch and Finn tell her that they need her help to get him off the street. Sorry, I turned him down for a date and he killed my fucking dog. I'm not messing with Harry Baker. But she points him in the direction of some kid who will. Kid's name is Philip and they find him huffing paint in the boy's bathroom. Better tell us everything. He says, fine. He's got a collection of skulls in Central Park. Oh, is that all? So we jump to Central Park where we're obviously looking for this stash of skulls. Cragen is getting Harry Baker's profile from Huang. He's a sadistic psychopath. He likes to take his time, draw out the pain. But just then, guess what we find? A cooler. Just don't open it. They open it and it's full of skulls. Probably cat and dog. Ooh, and a big hunting knife. Take that to the lab. So now we've got Harry Baker and his mom in an interrogation room. She's like, I'm not listening to these lies about my perfect son. Harry's like, take a pill, mom. So Harry goes on this little rant showing about how much he knows about serial killers and the trifecta, fire starting, bedwetting, animal torture. And his mom is like, I can't fucking do this. This kid is very scary. Mom needs a break, but she waves his Miranda rights. Okay, Huang, now that we have the green light, what do you suggest? His ego is too inflated not to inform. Get him to talk about the crime hypothetically. So that's what Benson does. She goes back in and is like, hey, you're so good at profiling. Who do you think did kill this woman? Oh, he bites immediately. Caucasian, male, mid thirties or forties. Menial job, lives alone. He was already in the park waiting in the shadows. It took her a while to find it, but the hunt is half the fun. 
Find what? Injured animal. Uh, why her? Maybe she rejected his advances. This whole time, he is like staring Benson's soul out of her body. He theorizes that it must have been a bliss attack. Maybe he used a rock. Bingo! That detail was never released, and that's enough to book him. But hang on, we just got the lugs back from Tilden's phone. Her last call came in at 6.37 from MFPCA. Wait a second, dispatch said her last phone call came in at 5.30. This phone call wasn't from dispatch. It came from a phone number at the kennels. We ran all the employees and only one of them has a record. It's Joe Paletti, the dog walker. We talked to him. Cragen's like, yup, he is a seven time rapist. We bring Paletti in just as they're cutting Baker loose. Paletti claims he has nothing to do with this. Benson and Stabler immediately try and break him down. And every time they escalate, the camera gets a little closer. You saw Pam every day at the kennel, didn't you? You were a rapist and those urges don't go away. You killed her because you didn't want to go back to prison. But he insists. He's innocent. They get a warrant, search his apartment, and find a stash. Nothing too crazy. Sex number hotline, nudie magazines. What's this huge stack? Oh, only 20 short stories of wall-to-wall -wall rape torture. Not only is he writing them, he's distributing them to other rapists. Gross. We don't have enough to charge for murder, but maybe we can get him on something else like indecency or something. The next thing we know, Cabot is sitting down with Paletti's lawyer arguing in front of a judge. Blah, 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 lawyer talk First Amendment. Blah, 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 lawyer talk obscene material. The judge thinks that Cabot is a little overreaching, but we'll let a jury decide. Jump ahead and they're reading the verdict. On the sole account of obscenity in the third degree, we find the defendant guilty. But it's only one year max. Fucking misdemeanor. Cabot tells Benson and Stabler, I just gave you one year to find the head. Stabler turns around and guess who's there? It's our favorite little psychopath, Harry Baker. Stabler is pissed and gets up in his face. I know where you live and I found your whole stash. Harry's like, oh, you think so? Uh, Cause there's never just one stash. So now Stabler is realizing, oh my gosh, Paletti's probably hiding something too. Now there's some major frantic energy. We're looking for the rest of Paletti's stash. He cut through a deadbolt, there's his van, and it's got blood in it. It's just canine blood, but the lab was also able to look at the tires and find specific, like, weirdly specific amount of information. Looks like this motherfucker spun his wheels over this kind of paint in this kind of mud with this kind of chemical compound. X-ray fluorescent spectrometer, blah, blah, blah. They're looking for a chemical plant, but only one of these places has the exact chemical makeup of what was in the soil. We jumped to the plant and there was divers in the water, but they're not finding any head anywhere. Okay, evidence guy, what did you find? Well, a couple hundred cigarette butts, a bra that's probably been here for a couple of years, and an earring. Benson's like, give me that. It's a golden, golden retriever. And in our last scene, Stabler has a meeting with Paletti and Possibly the power is somewhat out because it is dark as hell. What do you want? To gloat? For my year I have to serve? I can do that year stand on my head. What about this dog earring that we found where you dumped her head? You can't prove anything. Actually, it's got her DNA and a three point match to your fingerprint. So you can take that year, add 25 and choke on it. And that was Law & Order SVU season three, episode 13. Sorry for the animal violence. Jum jum. <laughs>